Good evening. Today's topic is international trade theories. There are some well-established theories we have to learn and we have to understand and we have to derive some insights based on the theories. Along with my lecture on different theories related to international business, I'm also going to discuss some insights and try to relate this with the real life situation uh, with the help of some uh, video cases. Video cases range from global outsourcing of services to countries like Philippines, India from United States. And that will give you an idea about uh, why this is taking place, what kind of theories this uh, phenomenon can be linked to. And we need a detailed uh, discussion deliberations with your inputs and uh, you know based on the PowerPoint and video cases. I would expect you to have a very good interaction today. We also have a case on InfoBeans. InfoBeans case, uh, depending upon the time, we can start with the discussion today and then we can go on to a presentation by Gabriel next week. So let me share my screen. Yeah, so topic for today, established theories in international business or very well-known theories in international business. So let's uh, begin with uh, a very fundamental historic theory called theory of mercantilism. Theory of mercantilism explain how and so on. For example, in the 16th century, gold and silver were the currency of trade between countries. And a country could earn more by exporting goods those days. That was the uh, notion and that was the idea. You produce and export. Those days, countries did not have currency. The main tenet of mercantilism was to maintain a trade surplus. That means to export more than the country imports. And this doctrine, what is called as theory of mercantilism, advocated government intervention to achieve a surplus in trade. So, this doctrine of this theory, theory that the main tenet of mercantilism, advocated government intervention to achieve a surplus in trade. With the help of support, with the help of government, with the support of the government, achieve a surplus in trade. This is the goal. surplus in trade with the government support, with the government intervention. This is how it works. And the idea is to sell more to strangers yearly than we consume of their in value. Yeah. Selling more to strangers yearly basis than we consume this. So which simply means export more, import less. So suppose whatever you produce in your country, we should export that more and we should uh, import less. This is simply mean to sell more. To sell more means export more yearly basis rather than consuming, buying from those countries. Theory of absolute advantage. 
This is another theory. This theory was founded by Adam Smith in his book, 1777, Wealth of Nations. And according to this theory, countries should specialize in the production of goods for which they have an absolute advantage and trade these for goods produced by other countries. In his time, British people, by virtue of their superior manufacturing process, were the world's most efficient textile manufacturers. Yeah. Theory of absolute advantage. Yeah, so this is simply, you know, if you read this theory's uh, main notion, it simply is based on the fact that the countries, each country should specialize in the production of goods for which they have an absolute advantage and trade those goods for produced, uh, trade those goods for, and for goods means, and buy goods produced in other countries which you cannot produce, which you don't have absolute advantage. For example, Puerto Rico might be having absolute advantage in certain commodities. You know, likewise, France has absolute advantage in wine production. France might have absolute advantage in uh, some other products as well. Japan has absolute advantage in certain industrial sectors. So like automobile, camera industry, and those kind of sectors. So they are not, not, not necessarily absolute advantage in Japan. They are also uh, created uh, or, or they have created that uh, advantage. They have, they have created that capabilities. But in some goods, like uh, French soil is really appropriate for uh, wine industry. So you can say that French has an absolute advantage in wine industry. And Puerto Rico is known for Puerto Rico has an absolute advantage on certain tropical foods like mango, papaya, and so on because of weather, because of soil, because of any other factor. So coffee industry, maybe we can say Puerto Rico has absolute advantage in coffee industry. So uh, Adam Smith uh, called for specializing in those goods where you have an absolute advantage and sell those goods to people and companies in other countries. This is the notion of theory of absolute advantage. Adam Smith also tried to relate with the real life situation. For example, according to Adam Smith, British people by virtue of their superior manufacturing process were the world's most efficient textile manufacturers. Yeah. British people, by virtue of their superior manufacturing process, were the world's most efficient textile manufacturers. This is another point. Yeah, textile manufacturing. British had an absolute advantage. Those days, but these days, if you look at uh, 2020, British may not be having absolute advantage in textile manufacturing. But those days, during Adam Smith's time, British had absolute advantage in manufacturing. And another example I already mentioned, it is mentioned, it is discussed here on the right hand side, due to combination of favorable climate, good soil and expertise, French had the world's most efficient wine industry. That is nothing but absolute advantage. And we move on to next theory. This is called theory of comparative advantage. Theory of comparative advantage was proponed by David Ricardo. And this is also known as Ricardo's theory. And according to theory of comparative advantage, it's an extension of theory of absolute advantage. And, and, and this theory states that uh, theory is based on the question. You ask a basic question, what might when one has an absolute advantage in production of most goods. This is what Ricardo is asking for. When you have, or your country has absolute advantage in production of many goods, 
how do you actually decide what goods you should specialize, what, should, what goods you should focus on exporting. According to this theory, it makes sense for a country to specialize in the production of those goods that it produces most efficiently. Yeah, so this theory, it is based on comparative factors or comparative advantage. Accordingly, this theory, the proponent of the theory, Ricardo, says, it makes sense to specialize in the production of those goods that it produces most efficiently. If you can produce certain items most efficiently, in that case, uh, you should specialize in that, you should export those items. And Ricardo also says that you should buy the goods that you can you, that you produce us less efficiently. If you, if you if you can produce certain items less efficiently, better don't produce that. Buy that from other countries. This is what is theory of comparative advantage. But if you can produce some items more efficiently than other countries or companies in other countries, specialize in that uh, item so that product and those products and sell those products to other countries. Relative approach. Theory stresses that comparative advantages arises from differences in productivity. Ricardo stressed labor productivity and argued that differences in labor productivity between nations underline the notion of comparative advantage. Yeah, relative approach. This theory stresses that comparative advantages arises from differences in productivity. Ricardo stressed labor productivity and argued that differences in labor productivity between nations underline the notion of comparative advantage. This theory stresses that the comparative advantages arises from differences in productivity. And you can also say that labor, Ricardo stressed labor productivity and argued that the differences in labor productivity between nations underline the notion of comparative advantage. So, according to this theory, comparative advantages arises when you have differences in productivity or differences in productivity lead to comparative advantages. Ricardo stressed labor productivity and argued that the differences in labor productivity between nations underline the notion of comparative advantage. And this productivity differences is mainly because of labor productivity. This is what is Ricardo talks about. For Ricardo, productivity is simply labor productivity. Labor productivity means people's productivity, human resources productivity, productivity of employees. If employees are, if employees can, work sincerely, work hard, apply their knowledge and expertise, labor productivity will be high. So that, lead, that will lead to better or high level of comparative advantage. We move on to the next theory called hexer ohlin theory. hexer ohlin theory, this is also called as modern theory of international trade. And hexer ohlin theory, according to hexer ohlin theory, all countries will export those goods that make intensive use of factors that are locally abundant. Yeah, hexer ohlin these are, these are the last names of some researchers, those who propose this theory. And this theory is called as modern theory of international trade, or it is also known as Hexer-Ohlin theory. So Hexer-Ohlin theory, 
the, 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 theory, the theoretical statement, the main statement of this theory is that all countries will export those goods that make intensive use of factors that are locally abundant. Locally abundant. For example, Lock, you know, factors that are locally abundant. Factors means, you know, factors of production. Land, labor, capital, they are all ca factors of production. Locally abundant means if you go to country like uh, Russia or China or even the US, they are land abundant countries because they have a lot of uh, area, a lot of land. So, you know, Russia, China, the US, they all land abundant countries. And name, name some countries that are labor abundant, name some countries that are capital abundant. I would like to hear from you. Hello, Professor. Yes. Yeah, well, um, I was reading here, like, for example, that the export of human research from India is uh, being a labor abundant country. Um, uh, in China, excels in the export of goods produced in labor intense industries. Yes, China, India, those kind of countries are very much labor abundant. I don't hear you well. Huh? Now, 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 now I can hear. Okay, so yeah, China has China and India have they, both these countries have almost 1.3 billion people, 1.3 billion labor force. So that is that is huge labor force. So they are labor abundant country. So according to this theory, uh, countries with labor abundancy should focus on intensive use of that labor and then try to leverage the opportunities arising out of the labor. This is what uh, this theory talks about. For example, when you, have, when you have abundance of labor, your labor will be relatively cheap. Your labor will not be very expensive. The, the wage rate will be less when a lot of people are available to work. Uh, and, and same way, when you have a land, let's say land abundancy, you go to Russia, uh, you know, price of land is very, very cheap. And you go to China also in some many villages in China, very big country. Uh, you can buy a lot of land. Even in the U.S., if you go to interior places, land cost is very, very low. Because U.S. is also huge in some states, you know, so a lot of land is just, uh, just uh, not used. So unused land is available in the U.S., kind of, you know, those kind of countries. So land abundancy. So when something is abundant, that will be less expensive. That will be in elements where that factor will be uh, cheap, you know. So this explains why land in some specific states of the US is cheap and land in Russia is cheap, land in China. I mean, if you go outside the cities, land is very cheap in countries like China, Russia and all. So because they are, they are the gigantic country, geographical area, you know, so like U.S. is also very big. So, uh, yeah, so China, India, labor cost is low because of a huge population. So, yeah, um, also, also here, uh, China um, has um, a textile and footwear, uh, they are low labor cost and they are like export that kind of good. Yes, because it is a labor intensive industry, you know, so the, such labor intensive industries, uh, people are willing to work at a very low wages and uh, so their uh, cost competitiveness, so they can price the goods at low price because when salaries and wages are relatively very low, so then they, they, their total cost of production will be less and that they can pass on to the potential customers so that they can keep the prices relatively low. So according to this theory, uh, comparative advantages raise from difference in national factor endowments. National factor endowments means land, labor, capital, those kind of uh, places. If you go to Switzerland, Switzerland is a capital abundant country. You go to Norway, 
Norway is a capital abundant country. They are not uh, labor abundant countries. So they have a lot of capital, money. So, uh, but labor intensive, suppose you go for a haircut in Switzerland, haircut in uh, Norway, it will cost you $50, minimum $50 for a haircut in Norway and Switzerland. Okay, why, why is it that? Hmm? Can you answer? There, uh, there are countries with a lot of capital, um, not that labor intensive, of course, as, as China. So you have, in theory, less, less amount, less offer, but people that can't pay for, uh, for more. And uh, besides the in Norway in particular, this, this countries they have a, a certain, certain advantage in terms of, of the currency as well and their standard of living. So the prices tend to be higher in relation to our our prices here. So they I mean, you know, so they don't have enough surplus labor, you know. So I mean, uh, the, the 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 people are not available to do a lot of jobs because almost everybody has uh, jobs, uh, uh, and they have capital abundancy. So capital simply means money abundancy, and but no labor is not abundant. So shortage of labor. Uh, so surplus capital, but shortage of labor. So automatically costs will go up, prices will go up. And uh, uh, you know, in China and India, a haircut in a decent barber shop or a hair saloon will cost only one dollar in China and India. You know, so one dollar. Here in Puerto Rico, in Condado, it costs approximately twenty-five dollar. In uh, Rio Piedra, it costs ten dollar. And in the U.S., uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, Florida, and all, it costs about twenty-eight dollars. And in Norway and Switzerland, it costs about fifty dollars. And in Norway, I was in Norway in Oslo, Norway, from Oslo town to Oslo airport, uh, the train ticket would cost you thirty-five or thirty-six uh, euro, which is almost uh, forty dollars. Okay, I mean, if you if you buy a train ticket from town to uh, airport. So that is the cost of train tickets in Norway from, from airport train from town. So, uh, so that prices are high. So when, when, when uh, I mean, you know, capital, when they have, I mean, so capital it become cheaper. So, but as a result, uh, prices go up. This is also another prices of uh, those kind of things will go up. So you see those kind of differences. So according to this theory, comparative advantage, you have some advantages in national factor endowments, and uh, it makes sense to use the factors that are locally abundant. This is what uh, um, the hexaroglin theory talks about, modern theory. Yeah, so I mentioned export of human resources from India uh, being a labor abundant country. So because a lot of people move out because uh, the you know being a labor abundant country salary level in india is not that high so they tend to go to countries where they can get a relatively high salary level the same story in in several other countries too like i was uh, in japan when i was when i used to live in japan i used to see a lot of people from philippines in japan this is because philippines is another labor abundant country a lot of people from Philippines go outside Philippines to other countries where they can get relatively high wages. And uh, I have seen the same story in Chile. When I was in San Diego, the Chile, I had seen many people from countries like uh, Bolivia, Colombia and all. They are working in Chile, mainly because, uh, you know, Colombia has a lot of people and uh, they, they, they can go to Chile. Chile, they, they, Chile has relatively high wages compared to Colombia, Bolivia and all. So, because Chile is relatively more developed and uh, salary levels are relatively high in Chile compared to Colombia or Bolivia. So, or uh, even uh, pe people from Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, they all go to Chile. Chile is the main destination for uh, people from other Latin American countries, those who want to work in a better uh, Latin American country with relatively high wages. So these are all examples because when other some countries like Colombia is a labor abundant country, uh, Peru may be also a labor abundant country. So they, they don't get a, a good job with relatively high 
salary or wages in their own country should they simply move out. So according to this theory, USA should focus on capital intensive goods and China excels in export of Chinese example, China excels in export of goods produced in labor intensive industries such as textiles and footwear, reflecting China's relative abundance of low cost labor. Yeah, so now the next one, we move on to another theory called Portes Diamond Framework. Portes Diamond Framework, uh, this is, uh, I mean, also called as National Competitive Advantage Framework. So this is a framework which Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, uh, HBR, HB, HBS Professor Porter, developed this framework. And he asked basic questions like, why does Japan do well in automobile industry? Why does Germany and US do well in chemical industry? And he tried to answer these questions. Porter found four attributes of a nation that promote competitive advantage. Porter found that factor endowments, demand conditions, which is home demand, demand from their own country, relating and supporting industries, this is another important factor, fame strategy, structure and rivalry, these four factors, these four attributes help a country to achieve competitive advantage according to Porter theory. And Porter says that, you know, Porter primarily four factors, then later he added one more factor. He says you need to have factor endowments. Factor endowments, again, the same story. Uh, in the previous theory, we had seen these factor endowments, land, labor, capital, and organization, those four factor endowments. So here Porter also talks about the same factors, land, labor, capital, all those factors. And Porter adds demand conditions, home demand. There has to be demand, home demand for a product in your own country. Otherwise, that industry will not be competitive in your country. So there has to be enough demand for that product in your country to create uh, demand. And relating and supporting industries. Uh, professor, I, I have a question on regarding demand condition. Uh, what, what is meant with sophisticated customers in home market? Yeah, I'm coming to that point. I think it will be in the next slide. Sophisticated customers will be like, you know, demanding customers. See, uh, customers, their expectations are high. If a country, have, country has customers whose expectations are relatively high, they are expecting high quality products. In that case, companies will be forced to make uh, products of high quality. Uh, you know, so that kind of demand is required. And for example, Japanese consumers are very sophisticated in such a way that their expectations are high. They would tell Toyota, hey Toyota, I really want a, an excellent Toyota car from your company. And this should be high quality, no compromise with reference to quality. I just want high quality product. So that kind of demand, it can be camera, it can be phone, it can be car, but high quality. That is the demand of sophisticated customers in countries like Japan in, in several industries. And Porter also says that you need to have relating and supporting industries to, that will help uh, an industry to grow, an industry to grow like a competitive industry. An industry will be globally competitive, uh, when you have a relating and supporting industry in your own country. Firm strategy, structure and rivalry. This is important. Yeah, firm strategy, structure and rivalry. Companies in a specific industry, their strategy need to be appropriate. Their strategy implementation should be better than company strategy, strategy of companies from other countries. And uh, structure and rivalry, I do have a video podcast uh, 
to explain this uh, this uh, last two three factors. You will enjoy that watching that. And uh, yeah, Porter's uh, factor dominance is explained. Porter says that a nation's position in factors of production such as skill level to compete in a given industry, basic factors. Porter classify these factors as basic factors and advanced factors. According to Porter, basic factor means natural resources, climate, etc. And advanced factors mean communication infrastructure, research facilities, etc. So Porter classify this uh, into these two different types of factors. Uh, according to Porter, basic factors come automatically because depending upon the country where you live or you work or you stay or whatever. And advanced factors means uh, communication infrastructure, research facilities and all this simply means that uh, you can create those. You can advance or you can try to create those. And, and uh, Porter argues that advanced factors are the most significant for competitive advantage. If you can create, if a country or if an industry in a country can create advanced factors like communication, infrastructure, research facilities, etc., uh, that will be most significant for creating competitive advantage. This is what is uh, factor endowment as per Porter's uh, explanation. That means any country can attempt, can make an attempt to achieve global competitiveness provided companies in a specific industry try their best to achieve greater communication infrastructure, research facilities, etc. Demand condition. This is another factor. A nation's firm gain competitive advantage or companies can gain competitive advantage if domestic consumers are sophisticated and demanding. Consumers are demanding and sophisticated. They will put pressure on local companies to meet high standards of product quality. An example is Japan's knowledgeable buyers helped stimulate their camera industry to introduce innovative camera models. So camera making companies had the pressure from the consumers that they uh, introduce innovative models day by day or year by year. And same as with demanding customers in Finland who helped push Nokia to invest in cellular phone technology long before demand for cell phones took off in other countries. Nokia was the pioneer in introducing cellular phones. Nokia is from Finland. In Finland, it was the need of the hour It was the need of the hour from people's point of view to have cellular phone because they had bad weather, bad winter. They travel, you know, when they travel, they felt the need for a cellular phone. So, and that kind of demand uh, motivated companies like Nokia to think about uh, launching a cellular phone. And they did research and development, product innovation, and they came out with a uh, uh, you know, new phone and such things. Porter's demand, national competitive advantage continues. Related and supporting industries. Presence of suppliers or related industries that are internationally competitive. Yeah. Supporter so says that you need to have related and supporting industries in your country so that uh, an industry will develop an industry will emerge as competitive. For example, U.S. U.S. has a very strong semiconductor industry and U.S. had technological leadership in semiconductor industry until the mid-1980s. This helped uh, the basis, this provided the basis for success of U.S. in personal computers industry, PC industry, and several other electronic products. This is because 
you need semiconductors, you need chips and all to make personal computers and electronic products. So this is a related industry. Semiconductor industry is a related and supporting industry for the PC or the, for the personal computer industry. So such kind of ambient, such kind of infrastructure, such kind of uh, uh, structure is required according to Michael Porter to create competitive advantage. Porter makes two points with reference to firm strategy, structure and rivalry. First, Porter says different nations are characterized by different management ideologies. Second, there is strong association between vigorous domestic rivalry and creation of competitive advantage in an industry. Rivalry induces firms to look for ways to improve efficiency, to reduce costs and to innovate. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, Porter's observations or Porter's finding. Rivalry and all those uh, things, uh, you know, Porter says that rivalry induces firms to look for ways to improve efficiency. There has to be rivalry in an industry. That will help companies to reduce cost and to innovate. For example, there is rivalry. Look, look at the, uh, you know, cellular phone providers in Puerto Rico. You have, or we have AT&T, we have T-Mobile, we have Claro, maybe one more. I don't know whether there is another one. Uh, how many companies are there? In, so there, there is a rivalry. You tell me how many companies offer cellular for cellular connection in Puerto Rico. Hmm? Guys. I mean, off the top of my head, I can only remember AT&T, T-Mobile, and Claro. Uh, there might be uh, like several other smaller ones. Like, uh, I don't know. I think was... Boost Mobile. Boost Mobile, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, yeah, so there is rivalry between all these companies. There is rivalry between uh, T-Mobile, AT&T, Claro, and all these mobile companies, there is rivalry. That rivalry is required, according to Porter, there has to be rivalry in an industry. Uh, that rivalry will induce companies to look for ways to improve efficiency. And that rivalry is a prerequisite from companies' point of view to innovate. Companies will think about innovation only if there is rivalry. Otherwise, companies will not innovate. Companies will sleep and they will do business in a normal way, they will never think about innovation. This is what Porter's argument. So there has to be competition in every industry, according to Porter, then only rivalry simply means competition. That competition and rivalry will help an industry, a company or companies to think about innovation, come out with uh, uh, better ideas and strategies to achieve global competitiveness and to offer better services and products. Yeah, Porter noted dominance of finance professionals as leaders of many American companies. He says many CEOs, many presidents of American companies are finance professionals, or they have finance background, according to Porter. And he links this with the overemphasis of US companies on maximizing short-term financial returns. Because if you want short-term financial returns, you need to have a finance guy as your CEO or as your president. Or also notice that one consequence of dominance of finance has been relative loss of competitiveness in those engineering-based industries where manufacturing processes and design issues is very important. This is Porter's observation. Yeah, Porter says that uh, in, in countries like Japan, engineers many, in many companies, uh, most of the CEOs or presidents have engineering background because they, they value technology more than finance or more than uh, any other subjects. So this is what uh, Porter found. Yeah. 
this is another theory product life cycle theory before i move on to another theory product life cycle theory i do have a podcast on this porter's uh, framework uh, let's let's look at this uh, five forces porter's framework you know porter's uh, it's an extension it's a slightly different uh, uh, podcast but it's an interesting podcast so let me let me share that video so i have to stop this one here now and then i have to take that one and then come back to this one So uh, after this, you have to discuss, okay? So you have to discuss uh, learnings from this uh, PowerPoint and this uh, podcast uh, after I complete the PowerPoint. After this uh, podcast and then uh, I will complete PowerPoint. After that, you have to discuss. Everyone. Welcome back to Strategic Management. Today we're going to talk about one of the oldest and well-known frameworks for strategic analysis, Porter's Five Forces, only we're going to deal with six forces. Porter's original framework included five forces, the degree of existing rivalry, threat of entry, bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of buyers, and threat of substitutes. Later, however, he acknowledged a sixth force, the role of complements. Let's start by looking at how we analyze the degree of existing rivalry. Some of the most important factors that we consider when we're evaluating the degree of existing rivalry include demand growth, concentration, product differentiation, excess capacity and exit barriers, and cost conditions. Let's start with demand growth. When the whole market is growing, individual firms can grow without having to fight to take share away from each other. Thus, the rivalry might not feel very intense. On the other hand, when the market is mature or in decline, firms may have to fight to take share away from each other to grow, and that's going to put pressure on prices. Now let's talk about the effect of market concentration. The most concentrated markets are called monopolies, and this is when one company controls an overwhelming share of the market. These markets face very little price pressure at all. The opposite end of the spectrum is a fragmented market where there are lots of small players competing vigorously, which often has considerable price competition. A third important kind of market is called the oligopoly. An oligopoly is when you have a small number of very large players. These markets can act like monopolies when there's tacit coordination and agreement not to compete on price among them, or they can be viciously price competitive with price wars that lead to serious losses. Next, let's talk about product differentiation. When you have low product differentiation, such as in the market for all-purpose flour, you often have vigorous price competition because even though you can brand the products differently and there might be minor differences, customers perceive the products as being pretty similar and they won't pay significantly more for one brand versus another. By contrast, when you have a market with high product differentiation, such as the market for sports cars, customers are likely to have a very strong preference for one product over the other. This means the products aren't competing directly on price and they can sustain higher margins. Now let's talk about excess capacity and exit barriers. Sometimes industries end up with excess capacity because demand has gone into decline or because firms built production capacity too quickly. This puts heavy pressure on prices and firms might want to shut down some of that capacity, but sometimes they face large exit barriers like investments that can't be recouped, union contracts, or pension commitments. Last but not least, the degree of existing rivalry is also influenced by cost conditions. If costs are mostly variable, like at a bagel store, a firm can scale back those costs if demand decreases, so it won't discount price below costs. 
On the other hand, if costs are mostly fixed, like at an airline, a firm could end up having to discount price below cost if demand decreases, because after all, you do not want to fly a half-empty airplane. Now let's talk about threat of entry. To assess the threat of entry, we have to look at two main things. First, what attracts entrants to the industry? And second, how high are the barriers to entry? If the industry isn't attractive, you don't really need entry barriers. But if the industry is really attractive, the barriers will make a big difference. Things that tend to attract potential entrants include profits, growth, and intrinsic sex appeal. Barriers to entry include things like high upfront capital costs, patents, and government regulation. Now let's talk about the factors that influence the bargaining power of suppliers to the industry. For example, suppose we're Starbucks and some of our suppliers include coffee bean suppliers, dairy suppliers, and baristas. For each of these categories, we're gonna ask, how reliant are we on particular suppliers? Are there very few suppliers or are they highly differentiated? We also wanna know if we face switching costs to change suppliers. Can they credibly threaten to forward vertically integrate into our business? These things will increase their power. On the other hand, we'll also ask how reliant suppliers are on particular buyers like us and whether we can credibly threaten to backward vertically integrate into their business. These things will lower their bargaining power. We use a similar structure of questions to analyze the bargaining power of buyers from the industry. For example, let's use Starbucks again, and now our buyers are individual consumers and grocery stores. We're gonna ask how reliant buyers are on us. Do they have very few choices, or are their choices highly differentiated? Do they face switching costs to change who they buy from? Can we credibly threaten to forward vertically integrate and get into their business? Each of those things will decrease their bargaining power. On the other hand, we'll also ask how reliant we are on particular buyers. Does one or a few account for a large portion of our sales? And can they credibly threaten to backward vertically integrate into our business? Those things will increase their bargaining power. Now let's analyze the threat of substitutes. Substitutes are things that aren't in your industry but serve a similar function for the customer. For example, cars versus trains in achieving transportation or getting your caffeine from coffee or an energy drink, or getting your hair colored at a salon or using a boxed hair color. The threat of substitutes increases when substitutes are similar or better in functionality and when they're similar or lower in price. For example, boxed hair color might be lower in price and more convenient. On the other hand, the outcome might be a little bit riskier. And finally, we have the role of complements. The value of many goods depends on the availability of complements, like games for your Xbox, a charging station for your electric vehicle, and buffalo sauce for your veggie chicken nuggets. The role complements play in the industry depends on the degree of dependence, the quality range and price of available complements, and the ability of complementers to appropriate the value in the industry. For example, the lack of charging stations initially made the EV industry less attractive. On the other hand, there's plenty of good buffalo sauce alternatives for your nuggets. And now you know how to do an analysis with Porter's Five Forces plus complements. Just for fun, here's an analysis of the retail furniture industry from the perspective of IKEA. You can screenshot it and go through it at your own speed. And here's one of the auto manufacturing industry. If you have any questions, just post them in the comments and I'll try to get back to you. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, please hit like and subscribe to get updates on future videos. Okay, so I'm going back to my PowerPoint to finish uh, my session, uh, my, my lecture uh, theory part, and because I still have to cover product lifecycle theory, the, the video that, that you have seen, Melissa's video is an explanation of Porter's uh, uh, framework. Okay, so now we move on to next uh, theory called product lifecycle theory. Uh, product life cycle theory from the point of view of international business has different stages or so six cycles. Cycle one is new product launch. Cycle two is sales in your own country. Cycle three is limited sales in other countries. Cycle four, 
regular exports from parent country. Cycle five, production in foreign country. Cycle six, reverse export to parent country. Reverse exports to parent country. That is a six, cycle six. So these are different cycles and product life cycle theory according to product life cycle theory. So, and, and almost every product goes through these cycles. And in some cases, uh, uh, like if you have a really unique business model, if you have a unique business, uh, unique product like Apple laptop or Apple's iPhone or Uber and those kind of uh, unique models, if you are a pioneer of new business model or new technology, new products, then you don't have, you can skip one or two cycles. Like you can skip limited sales in other countries. That cycle can be skipped. So you can even skip the next stage. You can uh, move directly into multiple countries if you have a unique business model or unique product. Otherwise, you have to go through all these stages. That's how it works. Mm. Uh, for example, um, the book uh, talks about um, the company Xerox, the, their home country was U.S., uh, but then the, the demand began to grow in foreign countries like Japan and India. And consequence, well, they start to, um, to go to um, India and Japan and sell to the US. Yes, I mean, that, 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 that can be reverse export. That is a sixth stage here, reverse export to parent country. I mentioned here, reverse export. Reverse export means, you know, once you start manufacturing in a foreign country, sometimes production in a foreign country will be less expensive, or cost of production in that foreign country will be cheaper and you can produce there and you can reverse export to your own country. I tell you one or two examples, Nike, Nike shoe company, it's an American company. And Nike, uh, Nike is doing. Nike is in, in uh, Nike's product life cycle is is in the seventh stage, seventh cycle. Seventh cycle means Nike make its shoes in countries like Vietnam or China, and Nike does uh, reverse exports from China or Vietnam to the U.S. to sell in the U.S. Okay. And the other, you understand? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Nike is an American company. I can give you some two more other examples. Apple, Apple laptop when you buy, or Apple iPhone when you buy, you look at product label that you get, and it will be it it it, it says, uh, I have at least three, three, two or three times experience of buying Apple laptops, and once I also got a, a Apple uh, iPad. Uh, as a as an award for my best selling case study on Louis Vuitton in Japan, so in that function that was held in Boston in the U.S. and even uh, when I got the Apple product in Boston, I opened and I looked at uh, uh, the product level. It says that assembled in China, designed in California, designed in California, assembled in China. So this was my uh, the, the 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 award that I was talking about. I got uh, Apple uh, iPad that was in 2010, 10 years ago. It, was, it, it, it used to say, assembled in China, designed in California. Even now, last month I, I purchased a Apple MacBook Air, uh, chip M1, and uh, I purchased from Best Buy in Puerto Rico. And uh, I looked at the same thing, product level, it says, designed in California, assembled in China. In Puerto Rico is part of the US. And two years ago, I, I bought, I purchased uh, a MacBook uh, uh, laptop from Florida and at that time the same story I opened the packet and I saw that it says that uh, assembled in China and designed in California so Apple is an American company A for Apple and A for America and uh, when you buy from America that what you get Apple is assembled in China so it is assembled in China and bringing back it is in the reverse export stage this is another example and I can also give you two more examples when I was in Japan, I went to Canon. Canon is a Japanese brand, camera, camera brand, Canon. You know camera, Canon camera? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, Japanese. 
and I, I was in Nagoya city in Japan. I went to Canon's real exclusive showroom to buy a camera and I purchased the camera and I, I, I looked at uh, uh, the product label, the package, the packaging, and it is printed, you know, made in China. And where did I buy? I bought in Japan and Canon is not a Chinese brand. It is a Japanese brand. So Canon, a Japanese brand, has been making cameras in China and reverse export to parent country, Japan, to sell Canon products at competitive price. That is the seventh cycle that we talk about here, reverse export cycle. So many companies, they only uh, have six cycle because if they only have production foreign country to sell in that country and maybe to sell it to neighboring countries, then they are not doing reverse exports. Some companies are doing that, that kind of business. You know, they are not bringing back to home country from a foreign country. So many, many companies have six, six cycles, six cycles, uh, some companies have five cycles. So depending upon the company and depending upon their company's uh, growth, and company's business model, so but product life cycle work. I also tell you one more example. I was invited uh, to Stockholm, Sweden by Stockholm Business School. I went there for a week and I went to the, the original, the very first uh, historical store of H&M. H&M is a Swedish brand. Swedish, uh, you know, you know, at Chandam, at Chandam, I haven't seen in Puerto Rico, but it is there in Miami. There's one of the mall of them one. That's one okay, here. okay, so yeah, it's a worldwide famous brand. And what I was curious to look at was uh, uh, how does the business model works in Sweden? And it's a Swedish brand. I went to the very first store of H and M in Sweden, the historical store. And I looked at many product labels and almost vast majority of their, uh, you know, clothings like uh, uh, jeans and uh, shirts, t-shirts, everything it says that uh, made in, made in Bangladesh, made in Pakistan, made in China, made in Vietnam, made in all those kind of countries. Yeah, um, uh, I think that, well, this, this theory of life cycle theory is very linked um, to the video that is called Made in the World, where it's explained uh, um, uh, a Nokia phone, uh, it's in, in the product that is made in China, but all um, the components of the phones are from different countries. Um, but at the end, the, the end point is China, so they put it uh, that was made in China. But in reality, um, like the phone was made around the world because each part of the of the phone are from different countries. Yes, and some some items it is like that. Some items, I mean, what you say is that, for example, if you look at a car, maybe your car's radiator might be Japanese. Tire could be uh, made using rubber from Malaysia. Car seat component leather could be from Italy. So, so and gasoline maybe uh, from Venezuela or from some other country. So, so, some products, if you look at, they are truly global. So, so that's a different concept. But then, and product life cycle theory. So, what we talk about is that uh, most of the uh, companies go through at least uh, four cycles. Suppose if a company is doing only export, then only four cycles. And uh, in case if company is also doing production, that is foreign direct investment in a foreign country, then five cycles. So, but in case if a company is also importing item from a foreign country where it produces uh, items, so, and then they are importing to their own country, then that uh, kind of that company will have six cycles like what is uh, shown here. So as uh, the companies with the uh, six product life cycles, I have already talked about some examples, Apple, Canon, Canon is exporting or importing cameras from China to Japan. Japan, it's a Japanese brand, it's a Japanese company. And uh, Apple is doing the same thing for, for laptops and iPhones assembling in China and bringing it back to the US. And uh, 
uh, Nike shoe making company is also doing the same thing and H&M is doing the same thing in Sweden and H&M has uh, arrangement to uh, you know uh, doing the garment manufacturing or, or, or textile uh, switching and other things in, in relatively low cost countries and bringing it back to Sweden. So all these are interesting business models and uh, worth discussing. So in case if time permits, we will come back to this one. So let me try to wind up this PowerPoint based discussion and then uh, we, I will give you time for you to discuss the insights from this. Uh, yeah, so some examples, hollowing out of US knowledge based economy, this is uh, global outsourcing. So with the help of video, we will discuss this. For example, work that costs $100 an hour in the US can be done in India for $20 an hour. The same with countries like Philippines. Accenture, a US company, moved 5,000 jobs to Philippines. I mean, in, in the form of outsourcing. So 10 or 20 years ago, a work that cost $100 in the US used to cost only 10 hour, only $10 in country like India or Philippines. But nowadays, last 10 years, countries like, especially countries like China and India, they have emerged. Wage level has gone up. So nowadays, the wage difference for an average job is only four times, or some jobs three times between the US or India, or between the US and Philippines. But 10 years ago, it used to be substantial difference it used to be eight times or ten times difference so but nowadays uh, because with high economic growth rates in some countries like india and china the wage level has gone up so it's an on average still there is four times difference for many jobs so that way a uh, lot of jobs are still outsourced for example there is an example given here processing home loan applications in the u.s you apply for a home loan in the US. Many times, banks in America, they send out this application to their partner company in country like India, like Infosys is an Indian company. And Infosys is a leading information technology company based in Bangalore in India. That is, Bangalore is the Silicon Valley of India. And these employees, working for Infosys in Bangalore in India, they process American home loan applications for California-based companies. And this is, another, this is an example. And, and they transfer these documents uh, via internet and then they process these documents. Another example is 250 engineers of Infosys develop information technology applications for Bank of America. CT scan. CT scan is also outsourced and scan is sent over the internet. There is something called Scan Cafe. So there is an interesting video about that, uh, you know, how this outsourcing takes place. Yeah, so there are one or two more models or one or two more, more theories. The next one is Uppsala model. Uppsala is a university in Sweden. Researchers at Uppsala University developed this model using data from Swedish companies. They found that the Swedish companies were internationalizing their businesses gradually. And the quality as they say, traditional companies internationalized gradually, stage by stage. And they call the model as gradual internationalization model. And oops, according to Uppsala model, firms grow in their domestic markets before starting exporting and foreign operations. That means according to Uppsala model, companies will have to achieve certain level of growth in their own country before they venture into international markets. In other words, I can say companies are born local according to Uppsala model. They are created to do local business first and then global business later. 
stage by stage. So this is also defined, or this can also be defined as gradual process of internationalization, capability build up in foreign markets. Okay. Also, oh, this is a somehow this closed. Okay, so I have one more uh, PPT, so I have to open it again. One slide is missing. Yeah, so Uppsala model simply means gradual internationalization, stage by stage internationalization. And the next model is born global model. Can you see the slide now? Yeah. We yes. Can okay. Yeah, born global model. Born global model means these companies are created to do global business. Like you are creating a company, you are establishing a company, your goal is to do global business. That kind of companies are called as born global companies. Born global companies are normally young companies. For example, companies endowed with very limited resources. I mean, a company may not be having, company may not be cash rich, but you can still do global business because you have a unique business model or you have a unique business product. And you can begin to do international business immediately after you find, after, after you establish your company. An accepted definition of a born global company is that your company derive at least 30% of revenue from foreign countries during the first three years. This is an accepted definition to classify your company as a born global company because if you can derive at least 30% of your revenue, total revenue from foreign markets from, I mean, during the first three years itself, that means your company was created. That, can, that, that means you can interpret it as a born global company. You can classify it as a born global company because you generate at least 30% revenue from foreign countries within 33 years means your goal to set up this company was to do global business. Yeah, so now I, I do have this uh, outsourcing uh, videos uh, to, to discuss and uh, I am going to stop uh, my PowerPoint uh, now and uh, you have any question based on the PowerPoint, we can discuss one or two minutes. If you don't have any question, I'm going to show at least one video and discuss the insights from one video first before we break. Yeah, any questions? Yeah, I would, I would appreciate in case if you can uh, you know, open up your uh, screen so that at least I am aware that you are attending the class. Otherwise, you can just keep the camera off and you can do something else at home. So I will not get motivated uh, teaching the ghost, you know, so otherwise it will look like a ghost. Yeah. Because sometimes what happens, it happens. I get many invitations for webinars these days. Many people are doing the same thing. So I tell them that if you're not going to open up, I'm not going to speak for an hour. So because it's, it's sometimes I feel like uh, some, sometimes, you know, people are not there. They just, uh, you know, keep it open and, and go to another room and sleep there and watch TV or something else, you know. So, yeah. Okay. So any question? Sorry for my background. <laughs> huh? Sorry for my background. <laughs> you have I'm trying to turn it off. <laughs> what is that? No. Okay, so you, you're doing some magic there? No, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a different, completely different thing. Okay, so you have any question? Based on the PPT, if you have any question, I can answer. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, start with my video one. And after that, uh, you have to 
So if I, if I play the video one, you have to also explain, everybody has to answer which theory that we discussed can, you can use to explain how uh, this video is related to which theory and insights from the video and you have to also link the video with the, one of the theories. All right. Uh, um, uh, professor, uh, I don't remember if we jumped the Leontief paradox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because uh, we have less time, it's not very important. Uh, you know, so that's why I didn't cover. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so in that case, I'm going to play my first uh, video. Watch this video before, so take notes and because you have to discuss, everybody has to discuss uh, based on the video, okay? You have to link uh, with uh, what this uh, video is all about and uh, which theory help you to uh, link this video, you know? So, uh, yeah, you have to link with the theory so that you understand the link. And uh, this is a scan which has just come in. It's a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, uh, which has come for pain. We basically have around 30 minutes as our turnaround time to generate a report. Okay, I tell you, I, I will introduce this video. So this is this is the video. Grammarly helps make your writing clear global and good outsourcing, Global outsourcing from the US to India, the first video, okay. So Grammarly, Grammarly came soon between. So global outsourcing from the US to India. That is the theme of video one. So we Vedanathan, Managing Director and CEO of uh, IDFC First Bank now joins us. Mr. Vednathan, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we got you at a time when things are indeed looking upbeat. Uh, the budget has surprised us. Growth is back from the throes of... And, uh, this is a scan which has just come in. It's a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, uh, which has come for pain. We basically have around 30 minutes as our turnaround time to generate a report. On a daily basis, we get uh, two of these uh, large air freight containers shipped from San Francisco to Bangalore. In this particular example, uh, we have lots of uh, old photos that are fading away. Teleradiology and Scan Cafe service very different markets but they are both examples of a new generation of fast-growing businesses bringing increasingly sophisticated outsourcing operations to India. You know, in 2002, when we set up teleradiology, it was uh, essentially unheard of. Everyone would go like, terror, what? You know, so it, it was a concept that was new. It hadn't been done. Doing it from India was, of course, unheard of because it wasn't even being done really in the US. It was just something that was so new. The company now employs more than 50 radiologists in India and other countries, sending back scans to hospitals in the US, Europe and Singapore in as little as 30 minutes. And they're now looking to expand their services into less developed places, including Africa. Scan Cafe, meanwhile, was started out as a class project at the Wharton Business School. It began scanning and enhancing old photographs, but now increasingly employs high-end designers to create custom-made photo books. Originally, the founders planned to do this work in America. And uh, when we had uh, the photo editing staff uh, in San Francisco, it was costing us roughly a dollar a photo just to enhance the colors and, and, and make it look nice and crisp. 
And very soon we realized that most consumers are not going to be able to afford paying a dollar per photo just for photo enhancement. And the cost differential between, between the US and, and a city like Bangalore and India is almost one is to 10 for a graphic editor kind of skill. India's first generation of IT outsourcers pioneered the use of call centers and basic software development from cities like here in Bangalore. But now a new generation is rising in which ever more complicated services are being undertaken in cities like this, from smaller organizations doing medical research or graphic design to established giants like Infosys, who in their campus around me have 20,000 engineers delivering complicated software products and even in areas like corporate R&D and financial services. Behind the frosted glass here, I can't tell you who it is, um, we don't disclose names of our clients, is a team of over 20 armor analysts working on a performance reporting system for a global asset manager. While we originally started out just doing sell-side research support, today we really support clients more at an overall front office level. And the reason this works, in some ways think of it as outsourcing 2.0, is that rather than middle office or back office transaction-oriented processes, we're actually taking knowledge processes that drive revenue and applying a combination of analytical talent from India, uh, experienced professionals who've come back from the States or London or Singapore, and adding the rigor of uh, what a traditional outsourcing professional brings in. When offshoring was being seen as a cost advantage, clients probably would have decided what they wanted to do. So it was in a services model, it was predominantly build the system for me or maintain the system for me, or test the system for me. Today, it is slowly shifting to how is the technology changing? How is the business changing? What can I do with this technology in my business? So they're expecting more and more innovation and then implementing those ideas as uh, solutions. Infosys and Amber are moving up the value chain, offering their clients ever more advanced options for research and innovation. But oil giant Royal Dutch Shell has taken this one step further by completely shifting some of its research functions to India. If we look, for example, at the bitumen activity, today this is the global center for research and development in, in bitumen technology. And um, it is activity that used to be done in, in France. Same is true for our polyurethane um, tech services, which was based in, in Belgium. Some in the West are worried that white collar jobs in areas like graphic design, medical research, or financial services that were once protected from outsourcing are now being done more and more often here in India. But this is the second wave of this country's outsourcing revolution. And now it is only going to accelerate. James Crabtree, The Financial Times in Bangalore. Okay, so now it is your turn to discuss uh, the insights from today's class and uh, linking with the video and uh, theory. And then after that, we take a break and then we have two more videos, uh, another one in Indian context, another one is Philippines context. So then we have Kahoot also, okay. Everybody, I will call up your names and uh, you participate uh, for favor. Gabriel, you start with Gabriel. Uh, so, um, we're talking about the outsourcing video. You are talking about, you are talking about everything that we discussed today. So, I mean, you know, so I mean, uh, you link with the video, with the, which case, whether you can link with any of the, any of the theory. So you, you are summarizing, basically what you're doing is you're going to summarize today's class, like insights or takeaways from today's class. Uh, you know, you talk about one or two theories and, whether, and then uh, also try to see which theory is related to this outsourcing. So is this outsourcing can be explained uh, with any theory that we learned. Okay. So, um, I mean, uh, the presentation is it's, um, an overview of all the different um, um, theories of, of trade, trade theories, <laughs> and uh, mercantilism. I'm not sure if I can remember them all. Uh, right, but mercantilism, then the absolute um, advantage, then comparative advantage, um, then 
architecture OLED theory, uh, which is the, uh, um, the, the one that gives, um, basically opens up the, uh, uh, the topic about the Leon Thief paradox that Wilfredo mentioned, which is about more of a uh, capital intensive versus labor, labor intensive aspect. And then the product life theory, I believe, and uh, or maybe we discuss first the Porter's diamond uh, five forces. Not sure which one we discussed first, but that's basically what we did during the pr the presentation. In terms of the of the videos, we had we watched one. the The first one was mainly about the five um, forces of, of Porter, um, and then we watched this last one, the outsourcing one, which uh, was really interesting uh, because it's basically uh, how the technology that we have is basically um, or allows us to basically take or use the uh, labor in the labor from labor intensive countries um, and put it into the hands of capital intensive countries um, through outsourcing, through basically the technology that we have. We can send things quickly. We can uh, receive them back fairly quickly. We have these um, countries that have extremely talented and extremely um, abundant uh, labor. And we have this, this countries that have extreme, uh, have extreme amounts of capital and the need, uh, for example, like Shell, uh, in this case, that is outsourcing their R&D department now to India. They have the need for this labor to be performed, so they're they can advantage of this using the technology that we have. So it's, I, I found that particularly interesting. Okay, so move on to the next person who is. Uh, I can see the screen now. Okay, so I have to open the screen. So Wilfredo. Yes. Um, well, um, regarding the, the class, um, today we, we discussed theories like the comparative advantage uh, that tells the productivity difference are important. Uh, also, we talked about the hector olin theory that tells that the factor of endowment matter. And endowment means like land, labor, and capital. Uh, also, we talked about the pro life cycle theory that tells where a new product is introduced is important. Um, also, at the end, we talked about Porter uh, that tells that all these factors uh, are important as far they impact the four components of the natural diamond. And the natural diamond uh, is composed about the Factor condition, demand condition, related uh, supporting industries and uh, firm strategy, structure and rivalry. Uh, regarding the video that we saw, we saw uh, this company that is called um, Scan Cafe. And Scan Cafe is a company where uh, they edit photos of different types. And they they are like outside. Um, it is related with the um, the life cycle theory um, because it's where uh, this company uh, is like uh, outside, and and you can use uh, research that um, that they are uh, outside. Um, like uh, with different low cost. I think that, that if, if you want to link the video with one of the theory, uh, I think that is the, the one that is um, the product life cycle theory. Uh, it's I'm not sure if, if I'm the, correct or, or wrong. Uh, I remember that when, when we were discussing the product life cycle theory, uh, yeah, we, we made it like um, like an example of, of I remember that we talked after the the product line theory that 
they were like uh, the loan processing application that were on uh, from the California firm um, Bangor. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just product life cycle theory, but let's uh, hear from others. How do they link this theory with the video? So next I see ja Jafat. Uh, I think my, my partners here explained well what we discussed here, but I want to add that um, the, the start of the PowerPoint of the PowerPoint to discuss like uh, that country should specialize in this uh, production of goods of which they have an absolute advantage. And I think this kind of, uh, at least Filipinas and, and uh, when I saw the video and I saw the videos also that they were, were sent at WhatsApp, the, this, the outsourcing is this, uh, is just the, I will say is, is the way that it manifests uh, the theory of, of, of advantage of some countries because if they are great or I know it's a service it's not like a, a product but if they offer better prices or better productivity at some things well companies should go for it and I think that's what ha what's happening with outsourcing um, and the money they could uh, save about doing this outsourcing in other countries away from the United States. Okay, let's move on. No, but, uh, no, but uh, which uh, theory better explain this uh, outsourcing, uh, you know, phenomena? So, I mean, uh, one of these theory or two of these theories can be easily related to, can be used to explain uh, this global outsourcing that we have seen in the video. Yeah, so let's move on to Nobato. Okay, hello. Um, of all the theories, the, the most um, interesting for me was the um, product life cycle theory. Um, and when I saw the video that we just saw right now, um, I think that this theory is the one that most explains, as Wilfredo said, um, the video because companies usually start producing products in the, in their home place, but then they, sorry for the music, they, they change to, to produce products, you know, in places where it is more cost efficient. And I think that maybe that's what happened with the company we saw in the video, that they were looking to um, reduce cost and find the most efficient ways of, of manufacturing the products or given the services that they gave. So let's move on to the next person and uh, I think Darlene. Yeah. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I will compare the last video that is for, from the outsourcing and offshoring, specifically in India, to the modern theory that all countries uh, will export those goods that, um, that are locally abundant. For what I've read, uh, there, are, there, there are a lot of um, software engineers, a lot of engineers at all. Uh, so I, I, I think they have found how to expand their economy doing that, that they are good at it. Um, there is something that is not mentioned in the, in the video, but I did read it on the case of uh, InfoBeans, that is the, the beneficial of the, of the time zones. Um, for example, um, we, we have um, many offshoring services, specifically in IS, in the company that I work for. So we use that in beneficial because there are some things that we can use overnight and does not interfere with our work. So I think that's very beneficial to have them. Okay, thank you. So Jennifer, then I summarize. Jennifer. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So in today's class, we discuss um, Porter's Five Force. That is a method that for analyzing competition. In this case, I will be focusing on degree of system rivalry. Uh, for example, in the first video, um, it explains the product differentiation. And when you have a low product differentiation, you often have vigorous price competition because even though you can run the product differently and there might be minor differences, customer perceive 
the product as being pretty similar and they won't pay significantly more from one brand to another. A, by contrast, when you have a high differentiation, um, you can increase the brand loyalty and consumers will consider it worth the higher price. Um, yeah, so anyway, let me summarize this with uh, uh, linking with the theory. So this outsourcing, global outsourcing, uh, can better explain uh, with the uh, Hexerohlin theory, that is the modern theory of international trade, uh, because uh, it talks about uh, uh, abundancy, local abundant factors. You know? So this is the basic reason or the fundamental reason why this global outsourcing is taking place is because of factor endowments or uh, local factor abundancy. Like this is the, the video that we have seen is the outsourcing from the US to India. This is mainly because India has abundant uh, uh, labor, I mean, uh, skilled labor uh, to offer this kind of services because India produces maximum number of engineers every year in the world these days compared to they are all studying in English. And uh, the large number of engineers are from India and China. So number one is India in terms of total number of engineers graduating yearly basis. And then China. So that, the, the thousands of engineers, pool of thousands of engineers every year. So that is the labor abundancy factor here. And they are available at a very competitive price, the, the wage rates. And, and then, um, you know, uh, they are also English speaking. So there are three advantages for US companies to do this, to, to this outsourcing in, in, in different sectors. So the modern theory of international trade of excellent in theory is, is, is more useful to explain this product life cycle because this is not an exporting transaction. This is not a river. They are not actually making a product. There. This video explains only outsourcing. Outsourcing is different from uh, production. Okay. So outsourcing, they are actually hiring a local partner in a local country for outsourcing. Outsourcing is a different form of doing business. It is not a typical form of exporting. Exporting means you, you I mean, reverse export product cycle theory requires at least some kind of production or some kind of assembly in a foreign location. That is not there in this video. This video is a classic uh, video of uh, global outsourcing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, the theory of uh, comparative advantage also is useful to explain this, but modern theory of international trade better explain this than theory of comparative advantage uh, is also uh, useful to explain this uh, in Ricardo's theory. Yeah, so those are the two uh, closest theories that help explain this phenomenon. So now let us take 10 minute break and then come back and then we have uh, two more videos and Kahoot and two, when we watch the videos, next two videos, I would request you to make uh, two statements about uh, the video and then we will play a game of two statements based on the next two videos, okay? One statement has to be true and another statement has to be false. Okay, let's take a break, 10 minute break.